Thank you so much, Susan, for the kind and in-depth intro. Uh, as Susan explained, um, we're going to talk to you today about uh, director liability particularly, but we have extensive backgrounds in representing directors and officers and companies um, in connection with Section 220 actions, which we'll talk about, and liability under Caremark. Um, so although mitigation of director liability is relevant and interesting, and I know that's what we're here to talk about, we have to touch on the case law, which admittedly is not always as interesting. So we'll do our very best to focus on its application and to avoid legalese. But if you have any questions, don't hesitate to put those in the Q&A or, or follow up after. Uh, the triangulation of, of the COVID-19 pandemic and uh, the economic downturn combined therewith, and then also recent successful care mark claims coming out of the Delaware courts, uh, in our view, increases director liability and exposure and should further motivate officers and directors to strengthen companies' oversight systems and so on to monitor the oversight and, and document the same in the minute. So I'll turn it over to Elizabeth to chat with you and to remind us about what those um, oversight liabilities are under Caremark. Hi, everybody. It's nice to be with you today. Thank you for giving us some of your time. Um, as as McKenzie alluded to, um, the, the law uh, around Caremark and other securities related um, liabilities is um, sometimes uh, mind numbing. It's often very long, um, but it is important to get sort of a grounding around um, what directors liabilities and obligations are. Um, so just to, to level set before we jump into more recent cases. Um, so Caremark is the decisive Delaware case that establishes um, what directors Caremark responsibilities are. Um, and in general, it is a good faith obligation to oversee the company's operations. Um, like all other issues under Delaware law, usually directors are shielded from liability um, in a very broad way based on the, the business judgment rule. Um, and so in order to get at um, directors uh, legally, shareholders have to go through a process of usually filing a derivative action on behalf of the company. Um, they either have to make a demand on the company itself to investigate the, the item that the shareholder is worried about, um, or they have to establish that making a demand on the company would be futile. And so most of these, most of these legal concepts arise um, in, the, in the procedural posture of um, a shareholder bringing a cause of action and claiming that demand would be futile. They do that by alleging that a majority of the board can't actually um, be trusted to determine whether litigation should go forward. Um, and it's often done by suggesting that a majority of the board is subject to care mark liability. So that's, that's how these issues come about. And that's that's generally how um, the courts in Delaware are approaching the legal analysis. So um, what are the care mark obligations? There are two. There are two main care mark ob um, obligations. The first is um, directors have an obligation to implement a board level um, control and reporting system to alert the board um, to issues uh, that they need to be aware of so that they can um, fulfill their obligations of good faith. The second is they have an obligation to actually monitor um, those systems and to take action based on red flags that are brought to the board's attention. So there are two, there are two different inquiries that go into um, an analysis of a care mark claim. Um, one, is there a reporting system at all? that's been established by the board. Um, it's very rare now that there wouldn't be um, a board level uh, reporting system that's in place. So most of the care mark um, claims and case law is developed around the second inquiry, which is, 
did the board fail to properly monitor um, and react to any red flags that arose through that oversight system? So with that baseline setting, um, we should talk about some more recent cases. I'll, I'll let Mackenzie get started on that. So as, as Elizabeth just highlighted, Caremark essentially requires oversight and, and monitoring of that system of oversight. And in Caremark, um, the Delaware court confirmed that a Caremark oversight claim is one of the very hardest to plead and prove. So what we've seen over the last decade plus is multiple cases over and over of plaintiffs attempting to prove camera oversight claims and failing to do so and being dismissed at the very earliest stage of the case, the dismissal stage. And the first change in tide regarding the application of Caremark liabilities occurred in, in a recent case, the Marshawn v. Barnhill case um, that came out of first the Delaware Chancery Court and then the Delaware Supreme Court in 2019. And so we're going to start by talking about that case. Um, it's known as the Bluebell case. Uh, in Marchand, a stockholder brought a derivative suit against key executives and directors of Bluebell, claiming that they had breached their fiduciary duties arising out of Bluebell's listeria outbreak. So as many of you may recall, uh, Bluebell Creamery suffered a listeria outbreak in, a, in about 2015, causing Bluebell to recall all of its products, to shut down production at all of its plants, and to lay off a third of its workforce. Uh, sadly, three people passed as, as a result of the Listeria outbreak and less consequentially, but, but nonetheless important to our analysis today, uh, stockholders also suffered losses because after the operational shutdown of the plants at Bluebell, Bluebell suffered a liquidity crisis that forced Bluebell to accept a dilutive private equity investment. Uh, in the Marchand case, the plaintiffs asserted a claim against the directors for lack of oversight under the standards developed in the Caremark case, um, which we previously discussed recognized both an obligation to attempt in good faith to assure that a corporate information and reporting system, number one, existed, and number two, that such appropriate information would come to the board's attention in a timely manner and be monitored. So in the first um, review by the Delaware Chancery Court, the Delaware Chancery Court actually dismissed the Caremark claims, um, finding that the plaintiff did not support the contention that the Bluebell board had failed to adopt or implement the reporting and compliance systems. This was kind of in line, like we talked about, with what we had been seeing regarding the challenge in bringing claims um, under Caremark. However, thereafter, the Delaware Supreme Court disagreed and reversed the Chancery Court, holding that the complaint, in fact, supported that Bluebell, uh, that the board in Bluebell had failed to implement any system to monitor Bluebell's food safety performance or compliance. And the Marchand Court emphasized that it wasn't examining, in this case, the effectiveness of the board level compliance after the fact, like it wasn't looking at it in hindsight, but was instead focusing on whether in fact, there was a board level system of monitoring and reporting in place. So they really were focused on prong one of, of Caremark. And we'll talk a lot about prong one and prong two. Prong one, as a reminder, is was there an oversight system in place? Prong two really is how was that system applied and monitored? So Marshawn highlights um, the plaintiff's effective use of the books and record request. In this case, they made a section 220 request under Delaware law and obtained the books and records and used those books and records to their benefit to effectively plead the case. The Supreme Court noted that testing reports received by management had identified listeria contamination in certain of Bluebell's plants, but the board meeting minutes 
reflected, quote, no board level discussion of these negative reports. So the plaintiffs highlighted that the books and records obtained via the Section 220 requests did not show that the board was discussing these issues. So it was really a negative inference, the lack of information in the books and records regarding the Listeria outbreaks that ultimately supported that the board had not been overseeing an intrinsically critical compliance issue to Bluebell and that issue related to public health and safety. So the court reversed the Chancery Court and Marchand as a result highlights um, the court's discussion that in fact, Bluebell had complied with FDA regulations, but that didn't imply a monitoring system by the board. Uh, the court will thus evaluate first the system the board implements aside from any mandatory regulations, and second, whether the board has made a good faith effort to monitor that system. So Bluebell really supports that a negative inference is enough. Um, so the, the question then ensues, and we'll, we'll discuss cases that have come after Bluebell um, at this initial stage, does Bluebell reflect in Del a shift in Delaware law with regard to director's duty of oversight? And I think there's an argument both ways. Um, I think most experts would state that no, it doesn't, um, that really um, Bluebell just shows an effective use of a tool by plaintiffs to more accurately and adequately plead um, what was being done at the board level and that that uniquely played out in Bluebell. Um, however, um, that in a sense also reflects a shift in Delaware law, which is that um, as plaintiffs have used Section 220 more prolifically, and courts have allowed that piece to happen, that is resulting in plaintiffs um, succeeding at the dismissal phase of these Caremark type claims um, more often than they previously had. Um, so Bluebell is both you know, representative of the, the typical standard, the standard itself is not changed, um, but it is an outlier in a sense that, you know, it, it doesn't um, mirror many of the cases that came before it. So I will turn it back over to Elizabeth to talk about the next case. So the next case that, that comes along um, in, in the wake of the Bluebell um, case is Clovis Oncology. Um, and this is a decision from the Delaware Chancery Court. Um, like the Bluebell case, it it also um, denies the defendant's motion to dismiss and allows the case to proceed. Um, Clovis Oncology was a, was a startup um, for all intents and purposes in, um, in the oncology um, field and developing um, cancer drugs, so drugs to treat cancer. Um, they were heavily invested in one particular drug that they were developing, um, almost to the exclusion of of every other um, potential revenue stream for the company. Um, and while they were doing clinical testing um, of that drug in the hopes of getting FDA approval, they were also simultaneously um, raising vast amounts of money um, through the markets. So they, they, were, they were in development while also trying to basically build the company out. Um, and that becomes important for the, for the course analysis around this. Um, Ultimately, the, the plaintiffs alleged that um, the development of the drug was, was ultimately failed. And there was no dispute about that. The FDA did ultimately did not approve um, the drug for use. And shortly thereafter, the company um, essentially collapsed. Um, the, the questions raised by the plaintiffs pleading was, um, when did the board, um, when should the board have known um, that the clinical trials that were being conducted by management actually were not conforming to um, the requirements the company had given to the FDA uh, in the early stages of explaining the plan for trials and moving towards FDA approval. Um, 
there, there's a lot of technical analysis around um, what those clinical trial requirements are. Um, in short, what was happening is that um, the clinical trials were returning results um, that were not being confirmed. Um, and as the plaintiffs alleged, the company was reporting out higher, um, higher than confirmed um, positivity rates in terms of, um, of confirming the, the drug's uh, ability to actually treat cancer. Um, and this case focuses on the second prong of CareMark. There was no dispute um, that there was a monitoring system in place. Um, there's no dispute that the board had set up um, an internal control system um, that should have allowed it to, to understand what was happening um, within management. So the case really focuses on the second prong of CareMark, um, which is the red flag prong. Um, and, and whether the board was one, appropriately monitoring the systems that it set up, and two, appropriately responding to the red flags that were, that were being um, raised within the system. Um, what's, what's important about this case, and, and ultimately I think what, what, what the decision really turns on, um, is also a, a, a line of um, thinking that began in the Bluebell case, which is, this was a mission critical um, component for the company. Um, there really was only one drug that was likely to be able to allow the company to succeed. And given that, it falls within a line of cases around mission critical um, revenue streams and what the board should be focused on. Um, similarly, in the Bluebell case, you know, Bluebell makes ice cream. <laughs> um, it is basically the only the only source of its revenue stream, um, and it's in a highly regulated space. Um, there are FDA um, regulations. There there's lots of um, compliance obligations that go along with that mission critical um, product, and and the same was true in in the Clovis case. Um, you know. The, the development of, of drugs, the testing of drugs, obtaining FDA approval, all of that is a heavily regulated and compliance driven part of the business. Um, and because of that, the court specifically notes um, that, that the, board, the board's obligation with respect to red flags in that space, um, it's not a heightened standard, but it makes it um, it makes inferences around um, whether red flags were ignored um, potentially easier um, to establish through well pleaded facts by the plaintiffs. Um, so that was sort of the carry on of, of the Bluebell case as we we move into Clovis, um, where where again the issue isn't whether the the plaintiffs will ultimately succeed because they're the decision is happening at the motion to dismiss stage. It's just whether the case can go forward. Um, and, and basically, um, again, the court reiterated that Caremark doesn't demand that the board see the future and, and anticipate every possible um, bad event that might come. Um, but it does require, and this is the language from the court, a sensitivity to quote, compliance issues intrinsically critical to the company. Um, and I think I think the nature of where the red flags were occurring um, largely drove the outcome in Clovis. And I'm going to let Mackenzie talk about the third scary case that has come about for potential director liability. Wonderful. So before I turn to the next case, I did want to highlight that one of the unique things in addition in the Clovis case was that the court there emphasized that where the director is an expert, because this board, the Clovis board, was composed of industry experts. And the court found that where the director is an expert, the court will not allow the expert to avoid liability, um, but instead kind of, again, is it heightened pleading? pleading? Maybe not. Um, or is it a heightened standard? Maybe not, but it, but it certainly requires active monitoring. And so where you have directors who are experts in the industry of the boards on which they serve, our advice would be to pay special attention to this recent um, 
turn in case law or or development in case law, um, in addition to the to the particularly vulnerable industries um, and company types. And so now we'll turn to the um, next case, the Intermarketing Group USA, the Armstrong dispute. Um, that is our first case in 2020. And this related to Plains All-American. And we talked about in Bluebell and in Clovis, the monoline businesses. And we'll see kind of a shift here that Plains All-American pipeline was not monoline. And we'll talk about how that applied. So here, like in Bluebell and like in Clovis, uh, the Delaware Chance Chancery Court similarly allowed the plaintiff's claims to survive dismissal. And in this case, Plains was a partnership uh, that owned thousands of miles of pipelines. Um, uniquely, this case um, is in relationship to the duty of good faith that was actually contractual in nature rather than based on fiduciary responsibilities. But regardless, the court relied on Marchand and Caremark in treating that contractual duty as if it were based in fiduciary principles. So here, uh, a Plains All-American pipeline ruptured and spilled oil into an environmentally sensitive part of the West Coast. And um, for a pleading stage case, this, this case arose in a somewhat unusual context. Here, the plaintiffs asserted that the defendants breached their fiduciary duties, again, by failing to implement or properly oversee pipeline integrity reporting. And here, the complaint cited specifically to testimony of the company's CEO in connection with criminal proceedings um, regarding the pipeline spill in which the CEO testified under oath in California that there were, quote, no board level protocols to monitor pipeline integrity. So again, although this doesn't relate specifically to a Section 220 request, we do have unique information at the pleading stage that allows the plaintiff to point to a lack um, of monitoring by the board. So in this case, though the company had an audit committee charter, um, so under Prog 1 of, of Caremark, we see that they had an audit committee and the charter outlined what that audit committee was supposed to do. So the oversight was there. The question is, was it being implemented effectively? Was it being monitored? And because of the CEO's testimony, um, the plaintiff cited no documentation um, that supported that they were um, performing their duties as required. So there was no documentation for the defendants to cite to about what they actually did. And the CEO's testimony that the board never discussed pipeline integrity uh, supported the inference that the plaintiffs made that the audit committee failed to perform its duties. Uh, so ultimately, the Delaware Chancery Court refused to dismiss the Caremark claims against the general partner, uh, finding that the general partner through the board had violated its contractual duty, again, the duty of good faith um, to Plains by consciously failing to oversee its mission critical objective of maintaining pipeline integrity. So again, we talk about mission critical in this opinion and that the pipeline piece was a part of Plains mission critical operations. And the court's determination that the company was heavy, again, a heavily regulated company informs what compliance concerns are mission critical for the board to oversee. Um, so in Marshawn and Clovis, um, we see a suggestion perhaps that a monoline business, one that relates just to ice cream and then one that relates just to a particular drug is more likely to be deemed mission critical because the board would necessarily have to oversee that monoline uh, business. But in Plains, um, Plains was a company that um, included transportation, pipelines, and supply and logistics. So it was kind of one of three major facets of the company that had fail, failed. Um, so Plains had multiple business lines, uh, but the court still found in Plains that the pipeline structure was mission critical for the board to oversee. Um, so this is both kind of an extension of Marchand and Clovis and also somewhat an expansion. 
Um, so we see some of the same applications and then we see it be applied beyond the monoline business structure that we saw in the prior two cases. And, and these three cases pretty much end um, what we saw as the string of, of successful cases by plaintiffs. And now we will talk about um, kind of the flip back to dismissals and distinguish those um, so that you and your board members can, can determine where you have particular exposure. All right, so the, the, the potential swing back to business as usual um, began in the middle of last year um, with Berman v. Brandt. Um, it came out of the U.S. District Court of Delaware um, dismissing a lawsuit um, and again, analyzing and focusing on the second um, prong of Caremark. Um, this is an, it's an interesting case because this is a, a dental supply company um, and the factual background involves allegations around um, both antitrust violations and fiduciary duty um, violations by the board. Um, in short, the dental supply company was um, allegedly engaging in um, some anti-competitive um, contracting uh, for several years. Um, and once that um, anti-competitive um, alleged price fixing um, was stopped by um, the, the then um, management in charge, um, as you might expect, uh, the profitability uh, for the company itself um, drastically fell. And so in response to the market reacting to that, um, sort of the, a slew of, of cases were filed, including um, just direct shareholder um, class action litigation and then the resulting derivative claims. Um, what's, what's noteworthy about this case is it's basically a return to um, you know, how courts normally look at Caremark claims. Um, and, and that ultimately the recommendation was it be dismissed. Um, here, the plaintiffs acknowledged there was a reporting system. Um, and then basically there was no, there were no well pleaded facts, um, no documentation provided by the plaintiffs uh, to suggest that the, the audit committee and other committees that monitored the oversight system weren't trying to do their job well. Um, and the fact that management um, was entering into contracts that were violations of, of um, alleged violations of antitrust law um, and artificially inflating prices isn't necessarily something that the board um, was either made aware of or should have been made aware of through this monitoring system. Um, so, so Berman is um, remarkable in the sense that it marks a return to the unremarkable um, or at least a potential shift away um, from the three cases that we've already discussed. Another opinion from the Delaware Chancery Court, uh, wherein the court dismisses the plaintiff's stockholders' claims, is um, in Ray MetLife derivative litigation. Um, and in this case, plaintiff stockholders uh, brought claims against MetLife, finding, and the court ultimately found that the plaintiffs failed to plead the sufficient facts to imply the director liability should be excused or the demand should be excused. Um, MetLife in, in this particular case had a longstanding business unit called the pension risk transfer business. And the, the purpose of that unit was to essentially undertake other businesses, fixed benefit pension obligations to employees by agreeing to pay out an annuity to the employee once the employee retired and benefits became payable. So in this dispute, MetLife was a little slow to adopt new technologies and tracked and gave notice to the employee annuitants of their entitlements at the address that the employer initially provided by, by regular mail letters sent to the employee when the employee turned 65. Um, and again, when they turned 70, which was called the two letter policy. This suit arose after MetLife revealed in one of its 8K disclosures that it had discovered weaknesses in its two letter policy um, that noticed annuitants and that it would enhance identification 
of those individuals and then strengthen reserves, um, which it warned could be material to its operations. So the plaintiffs alleged that the director defendants failed to refuse or, or refused to implement regulator mandated remedial measures to this pension risk transfer business and or knowingly um, failed to put in place or monitor a system uh, and controls to ensure the identification of unresponsive and missing group annuitants. Uh, at the Delaware Chancery Court, the court wholly rejected the plaintiff's assertion under the first prong of Caremark. So again, prong one, they found it was very clear from the complaint that MetLife had this extensive network of internal controls. Um, so the court then turned to prong two and analyzed whether plaintiffs could establish that the board's bad faith um, was evidenced by red flags related to compliance um, with the law and conscious disregard of those flags. So the court ultimately concluded that the plaintiffs had failed to offer specific allegations um, to reasonably infer that the board was aware of or ignored two specific red flags. Number one, um, there was a regulatory action in 2012. And number two, there was a 2016 internal auditor report. Um, and that internal auditor report identified the issues. Um, the internal auditor report identified the control weaknesses and addressed them, but then the audit committee didn't follow up or there was no indication that the internal audit report was brought to the attention of the full board. So the audit committee knew about it, but there's nothing in the notes um, showing that the full board had addressed the issue. Um, however, the court stated that um, MetLife's board's failure to undertake immediate remediation of a reported defect, even where immediate action would be wise, is not evidence of bad faith unless it implies a need to act so clear that to ignore it implies a conscious disregard of duty. So the court found that the audit committee's failure to ensure remediation and alert the full board within a year didn't amount to indifference in the face of a duty to act, um, and even so would taint only a minority of the demand board. So the same fact pattern may have played out, we don't know, but it may have played out very different in the context of a public health issue, like we've discussed related to Marchand, related to Clovis, and related to the intermarketing case regarding Plains Pipeline. Um, further, had potentially additional time passed, maybe longer than a year, and the issue had not been disclosed, the result also may have been different. Um, but regardless, this fact pattern weighs in favor of advising audit committees to be aware of what they are and are not reporting to the full board and what the timing of doing so should be and what the documentation of doing so should be. So again, as, as we saw in Marchand, the negative inference of that report does not necessarily mean that it wasn't immediately reported to the full board. It could be that it was not adequately documented. Um, but it's certainly some indication for the plaintiff to plead that it was not reported to the full board. Um, so when we compare um, MetLife to Bluebell and Clovis and Intermarketing, um, I think we see a number of differences, the main one being that um, this wasn't a heavy, heavily regulated area. This didn't relate to public health and safety. Um, and that the audit committee was in place and was aware of the issues and had documented that piece, but had not made the full board aware of the issue. Um, so um, I think that that instructs, and we'll get more into this and once we've discussed all of the cases, um, our practical advice to provide clients in terms of record keeping and in terms of communications between special committees and the boards in which they are serving. Thank you, Mackenzie. I, I, um, I, I think your um, conclusion that, that on different facts, um, the prior case may have gone a different way is, is buttressed by um, the result uh, in the next case, 
um, which is um, another another case of the Delaware Chancery Court where the magistrate judge and then ultimately the, the district court judge refused to dismiss derivative claims um, against uh, a company that was operating within um, the cancer drug space, um, among other spaces. Um, so this is this is an interesting case, and I think it does highlight um, that ongoing refusal to act in the face of obvious red flags um, is going to continue to be a problem. Um, and I don't know that it actually indicates a swing back um, towards um, you know the potential expanded liability under the Bluebell case in Clovis, um, but it does fall in that same kind of um, set of cases where you're dealing with public health, you're dealing with heavily regulated parts of a business. Um, and in, in the Amerisource Bergen case, you're, you're dealing with allegations um, of ongoing years long refusal um, to acknowledge and act on red flags. And I'll, I'll get to that as, as we cover the facts. Um, so Amerisource had a, um, a, a subsidiary um, that was running a pre-filled syringe program um, for cancer drugs. And the, the pre-filled syringe program basically was um, the subsidiary would purchase single dose um, syringes or vials of um, this cancer drug and then turn around and sell them um, for providers to actually give to patients. Um, it's a common practice in, in the um, pre-filled syringe space um, that there is an intentional overdose that's put into um, the initial vial. And that's to allow um, providers to um, make sure that they have enough for the dosage. It allows for um, the potential that you might need to, um, anybody who's had a shot um, recently may see them having to actually you know, push air out of the syringe and you lose some. Um, of the actual drug. Um, and what was allegedly happening um, at this subsidiary is they were acquiring the pre-filled um, vials, purposefully removing the overfill um, when they put it into the syringes and then um, combining the overfill in, um, in an improper way to then create additional dosages that they could sell. Um, and there were all sorts of problems with this, not the least of which is it was being done in violation of FDA protocols, um, and that it was also being done in a way that um, contaminated the, the excess drug dosages itself. So those are the, the allegations at issue um, in terms of the actual problematic uh, process that the company was, was engaged in. Um, so again, we're looking at a cancer drug, we're looking at a very heavily regulated um, part of the business. In addition, um, and, the, and the court spent a significant amount of time focusing on this. Again, this is a second prong case. Um, there was no doubt that there was uh, a, set of the, a set of the board that was supposed to be monitoring um, and had compliance uh, mechanisms in place. Um, it's, it's a purely red flag case. Um, and there were a number of red flags that occurred over um, many years. Um, the first was the company actually hired an independent law firm to conduct uh, an internal investigation. Um, that report came back and, and highlighted um, specific instances of where compliance was lacking, um, where the controls themselves might be lacking, um, where a system overhaul might be needed. Um, and at least based on the allegations, um, nothing happened for several years in response to that report from an independent law firm. Um, that report was given to the board, um, so that was the first red flag. Um, the, second, uh, the second red flag um, was a very high-ranking whistleblower, um, so a COO who ultimately was terminated from the company raised uh, concerns about the pre-filled syringe program internally um, and in response, uh, at least allegedly, was fired. Um, a second law firm did an analysis um, around the controls in place and also made recommendations um, that were um, seemingly ignored. And then the COO whistleblower ultimately filed um, a QTAM action. Um, so all four of those things happened. 
Um, and generally the company didn't do anything in response. Um, and so in the face of that um, factual, that set of factual allegations that have to be credited as true, um, the court said, there's no dismissal available here. Um, what's interesting is, is the court focused on the second prong um, and, and basically said, you know, I'm not even gonna deal with the first prong, um, but then dropped an interesting, um, arguably set of dicta that said, um, it's possible that the compliance system itself was also not um, sufficient. So yet to be seen what happens uh, in terms of the full merits of that. Um, you know, I think there, there are two different ways to look at this. Um, you know, one is, are we swinging back to, to potentially being um, in Bluebell and Clovis land? Here, I think the facts here are just so bad um, that, that frankly, even if this wasn't a public health space, my assessment is in the face of multiple red flags over years, uh, it's gonna be hard to argue that, um, that Caremark was satisfied. Um, but I do think it's meaningful that, that we continue to see um, cases that tend to go against the Caremark grain in the public health space. Delaware Chancery Court's decision in um, this Lending Club case um, is another example of really the shift back or, or the, the staying in the concept of the difficulty that the plaintiff's face and adequately alleging um, demand futility in the context of these derivative corporate oversight claims that are governed by Caremark, um, especially, and we'll talk about this, in the face of an exculpatory provision that's contained in the corporate charters, which most contain. In this case, Lending Club operates an online lending marketplace platform that connects borrowers and investors willing to fund loans. And in 2016, Lending Club disclosed its material weaknesses and internal controls. The primary areas of concern included the sales of near prime loans, the review of related party transactions, and lack of transparent communication and oversight of investor contract amendments. Also in 2016, the FTC sent Lending Club a CID to investigate uh, deceptive and unfair trade practices with consumers, and then later in 2018 filed suit against Lending Club for those same actions. So here the plaintiffs argued that both prongs were satisfied as evidenced by and pointing to the lawsuit by the FTC filed against the company in 2018, um, alleging that it had engaged in these unfair and deceptive uh, consumer practices. So in this case, the court concluded that the mere existence of an internal reporting system flowing up to the board level um, established that the board had made a good faith attempt uh, to implement the required monitoring structure. Here, the plaintiff conceded that the board had established a functioning risk committee and that that risk committee uh, was enough given the existence of, of the system. The court concluded that it, it couldn't be said that the board had utterly failed to implement um, the system or controls. Um, so the court then turned to the second prong of Caremark and the court determined that there as well, the plaintiffs had failed to provide uh, specific allegations to support the existence of deliberate oversight failure and declined to infer conscious failure to monitor based on allegations that didn't identify specific red flags um, to any alleged illegal conduct. Um, here, the court instead explained that the plaintiff's generalized allegations related to board presentations referencing an increase in customer complaints and board discussion of an ongoing FTC investigation were not sufficient to adequately allege board knowledge of ongoing legal violations. It's um, also of import, of, um, of import to note that this decision reinforces um, that in this case, Lending Club had an exculpatory provision in its corporate charters and that the presence of that exculpatory provision um, in and of itself created a high bar for purposes of the demand futility analysis. 
Um, so the court made special note of that as kind of a third prong that it looked to. Um, so we have yet another instance of the plaintiff failing um, to adequately allege um, liability under Caremark. And I, I want to be conscious of our time here because I want to make sure we're, we're able to answer questions if we can. Um, so I'm going to I'm going to do I'm going to quickly talk about the FedEx case, um, which was um, again it's it's an an example of um, a derivative claims being dismissed um, and another example of the court focusing on prong two. Um, there was the so the factual history here. Um, is around FedEx's historical um, shipment of cigarettes, which is a highly regulated space um, and alleged violations that occurred in the 2008 to 2012 timeframe, um, allegations that, that the shipping of cigarettes was not complying with federal law or New York state law. Um, and, and based on on those allegations and some ensuing um, government enforcement actions, um, FedEx ultimately decided in 2016 to get out of the shipping of cigarette business altogether. Um, and between sort of the revelation of, of these enforcement actions um, and the decision to get out, there were various other things that the board engaged in doing um, in response to both the enforcement actions themselves in response to um, a prior demand that was sent by a different shareholder um, around the shipment um, of cigarettes and in response to um, an independent investigation that they um, commissioned from an outside law firm. Um, there, there's, there was no real dispute um, from the plaintiff that, that all of those things happened and, and that the company did um, actually implement changes in the structure of, of how they were um, responding um, to complaints being made. The, the primary argument put forth by the plaintiff um, for why uh, Caremark wasn't satisfied is, is basically that the company took too long to do that. Um, the, court, the court rejected that idea um, and, and ultimately said that one, there was, no, there was no suggestion that there wasn't a compliance um, structure in place. Um, and that the board and the audit committee um, were being given, routinely being given updates about the cigarette shipping situation, including updates on the active litigations um, and investigations being conducted by the government, um, that they were reacting in real time to those updates. Um, and basically that the board was doing everything it could um, while the company was still under active investigation and threats of lawsuits. Um, and so here again, we see, um, you know, I don't know that it's a return to the deference that, that's mandated by Delaware law, but an explanation that even if a board is not acting as quickly as a particular shareholder would like in response to red flags, if, our, if they are reacting to those red flags in a manner that appears reasonable, um, and they are not and not ignoring the red flags, and they are being updated. Um, that is going to be incredibly difficult to to get to um, a well pled allegation of bad faith, um, which is essentially what's required uh, in order to satisfy the second prong of Caremark. So again, in the interest of time, I'm just going to quickly highlight three cases outside of the Delaware Chancery Courts. One in Texas, one in California, and one in DC that all apply Caremark and that in addition to kind of the typical deference, um, dismiss claims um, on the basis of, of this um, oversight liability not being, um, not being in violation of Caremark. And so we will turn finally to our full application. I'll turn it over to Elizabeth. Um, yeah, so what, what is all this, um, you know, potentially fascinating, very long um, case law mean? Um, and what are, what are our recommendations? Um, so, you know, again, the key takeaway with respect to Caremark and every, every case that is, that is looked at Caremark um, liability is there are two requirements. One, implementing the reporting system. 
um, and two, that the board or audit committee um, is actually continuously monitoring that system um, and receiving updates and information from it and appropriately responding to it. Um, again, most of the case law focuses on two. Um, it's rare that a company wouldn't have an implementing and reporting system, but it is worth looking um, at the scope of those systems um, on the front end uh, to figure out if there are gaps or obvious um, potential issues around getting the information actually up to the board level. Um, I think the biggest key takeaway from the recent developments um, and the results that we've talked about today is um, because the focus is often on whether the board is complying with their obligation to monitor the system they put in place, it is vitally important that the minutes include um, sufficient discussion um, of that monitoring process. Now, this is a double-edged sword, right? Because the more detail you put into your minutes, um, potentially, the more plaintiffs could assert that directors should have been more aware of red flags. Um, and so it's important to reach out to um, either your internal counsel or outside counsel to talk through um, the level of detail that, that you want to ensure is happening. Um, but the very worst situation is to have either the minutes be completely silent about how the board um, and its committees are getting updated about their monitoring, um, or to have just incredibly vague references um, that suggest that there was no meaningful discussion um, around what was happening. Um, and, then, and then finally, um, because so much of, of what's happened in the last two years um, has been happening in the public health space, health space, and Mackenzie alluded to this in the introduction, um, the ongoing COVID-19 pandemic um, and the resulting impact um, on, on the market um, creates an environment in which um, tag-along derivative litigation is likely to be coming. Um, we're in a very um, fluid and shifting space around government requirements with respect to COVID-19. Um, you all know that you are often facing um, conflicting mandates from different levels of government. Um, and so having the board and the committees who are tasked with oversight with respect to COVID-19 specifically, um, documenting the efforts that are going into that um, documenting reliance, um, not, not the specific advice coming from the lawyers, but documenting um, that lawyers are involved in that analysis. Um, those things will help insulate directors from the future lawsuits that are likely to be coming um, as the rest of COVID shakes out. And then I wanna open it up to Mackenzie to give her uh, additional practical advice too. Actually, since we just finished um, hit one o'clock, we're going to cut it off there. Elizabeth did a great job um, outlining the risk and the oversight and the processes and, of course, the increased documentation. So if you have any questions, we're happy to answer those uh, via email and um, Susan can provide our information, but it's also available right here on this last slide.